it's a summary of termination of a civil marriage. A civil a marriage can be terminated or can dissolved in three ways. The first is through death of a spouse or both spouses. When the spouses are married in community of property, the death terminates the marriage as well as the joint estate. The executor of the the executor that has been appointed to administer the disease estate is going to wind up uh, or administer the disease estate, and during the winding up process, uh, the disease estate, uh, the disease estate debts that were incurred or that were made before the marriage are paid from the fifty percent share of the data. In other words, of the spouse who made the debt, irrespective of whether the uh, the the debtor or their spouse has passed away or is the surviving uh, spouse. When the spouses are married out of community of property, the antinatural debt, in other words, uh, the debt, uh, the antinatural debt, are not terminated by death of either spouse. So. As I said, when spouses are married in community of property, the marriage terminates the it terminates the marriage and the joint estate. And when the spouses are married out of community of property, the death terminates the marriage, but the antinatural death, the, uh, the death that the spouses have, are not terminated by death of either spouse. The executor. Uh, the executor who winds up or who administer the disease estate has a responsibility of ensuring that the debts are paid, the debts of the spouse who have uh, passed away are paid from their estate before uh, this applies for both if they're married in community property or out of community property. The debt needs to be paid first before inheritance can be distributed. In other words, when the spouses are married in community of property before the 50% share of their surviving spouse can be given uh, to them and uh, and also the rest of the inheritance and also when the spouses are married out of community property without with the accrual system they need to uh, make sure uh, that the debts are paid first debts are paid first before inheritance can be distributed when spouses uh, uh, when spouse uh, when the spouse passes away and let's say the surviving spouse was financially dependent on their spouse they have a right to claim maintenance in the disease estate this maintenance is claimed in terms of the maintenance of surviving spouses act Uh, the claim can be brought by a spouse who is unable to provide for themselves, irrespective of the marriage contract or the matrimonial property system that their spouses have entered into. So this means that whether the spouses are married in community of property or out of community of property, a spouse who is in financial need has the right to bring in a claim uh, on the disease estate in terms of the maintenance of surviving spouses. Act. The surviving spouse must claim a reasonable amount that they will need to survive. <laughs> When determining the reasonable needs of a surviving spouse, there are factors that uh, are taken into account. Please see page seven, please see page 117 of your prescribed textbook uh, to read and to formalize yourself with these factors that are taken into account when determining the reasonable needs of the surviving spouse. This was uh, the first if a marriage is dissolved through death. The second way a marriage can be dissolved is through an annulment of a voidable marriage. An annulment is a legal procedure, uh, is a legal procedure 
uh, that is taken or a legal procedure, in other words, the spouse brings in a matter to court to have the marriage declared null and void. We must uh, remember that avoidable marriage is a marriage that uh, has not complied with all the legal requirements of entering into a legally recognized marriage, but uh, that marriage is not a uh, void. In other words, it's not uh, automatically null and void. So a spouse who wants uh, their marriage, which is voidable, to be declared null and void, has to bring in a court application to have that marriage declared null and void. The third way of terminating a civil marriage is through uh, the divorce process. A marriage through a divorce process or a, can only be dissolved by a court of law and can only be uh, dissolved either by the high court or uh, the regional uh, court through their divorce, uh, the divorce section. All regional uh, courts have a divorce court a section which, uh, which specializes in dissolving uh, marriages, be it uh, civil marriages or other marriages, customary marriages and civil union uh, marriages. A divorce is regulated by the Divorce Act and in terms of the Divorce Act, there are three grounds uh, to dissolve a marriage. The first ground is the irretrievable breakdown of the marriage. The second ground is uh, the incurable mental illness of a party or of a spouse in the marriage. And the third ground is the continuous unconsciousness of a spouse to the marriage. The grounds for divorce can be found in section four, subsection one, and section four, subsection three of the Divorce Act. Please see page 121 to 122 of your prescribed textbook for the guidelines on all the grounds uh, for terminating a civil marriage. Section 5, subsection 1, and sub, uh, section 5, subsection 2 of the Divorce Act regulates termination uh, in terms of mental illness or, uh, or for unconsciousness. So section 1, subsection section 4, subsection 1, and section 4, subsection to regulate the grounds for an irretrievable breakdown of a marriage. And section five, subsection one, and section five, subsection two, regulates the ground for an incurable mental illness or continuous unconsciousness, unconsciousness of a spouse to a marriage, to the marriage. It is also very important to know that once a spouse has filed for a divorce, a divorce court does not have the discretion to refuse to grant a divorce. Once it has been proven that the marriage has irretrievably broken down. The exception, however, is Section 5, Subsection A of the Divorce Act, which regulates uh, marriages which have been entered into in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, civil, uh, civil marriage, in other words, in terms of the Marriage Act, as well as those that have, uh, as well as the, uh, as well as religious uh, rights, religious grounds, for example, uh, if spouses enter into a religious marriage and over and above, they enter into the marriage in terms of the marriage act. So those spouses entered into a marriage using two systems, their, their religious rights, a religious marriage, as well as the civil marriage. Section 5 
A, a section 5 capital A provides that if it appears to a court that granting a divorce granting a degree of divorce will result in either spouse or both spouses being unable to remarry because of their religion unless the marriage is also is also dissolved in accordance with the prescript of that religion. The court can refuse to grant a degree of divorce unless it is satisfied that the steps will be taken to dissolve the religious marriage or to remove the bar or to remove the obstacle that will prevent the spouses from remarrying. So, uh, the only exception is Section 5, uh, capital A. That is the only uh, exception when a court can refuse to grant a divorce. Uh, other than this, no divorce court or no presiding officer in a divorce court has a right to refuse to uh, has a right to refuse to grant a divorce uh, a degree of divorce if it if it has been proven that the marriage has irretrievably broken down now let's move on to the patrimonial consequences of a divorce when spouses uh, are undergoing a divorce, one of the processes that occur is to determine uh, how are they going to dissolve the matrimonial estate. And dissolution of the matrimonial estate uh, depends on the kind of marriage contract that they have entered into. Spouses who are married in community of property, they jointly uh, co-own all the assets and the debts of the joint estate. If spouses are married out of community of property without the accrual system, uh, if spouses they can agree that each spouse can retain whatever is theirs. And if spouses are married out of community of property with the accrual system, the accrual calculation or the accrual uh, uh, calculation process will uh, can uh, take place so that the spouse whose estate is lower gets to keep everything that is theirs and uh, and that spouse will have a share in the other spouse's estate and a share which is half the difference uh, between both their estate values, net values. Spouses, uh, however, are allowed to determine themselves how they want to dissolve their matrimonial estate, irrespective of the kind of marriage contract that they have entered into. In terms of Section 7, Subsection 1 of the Divorce Act, spouses can enter into a written uh, agreement. This agreement is called a settlement agreement. A settlement agreement, it is a written document that sets out the terms of the spouse's divorce. For example, the division of their matrimonial estate, the parental responsibilities and rights of the minor children, and, and also of uh, the adult children, uh, if those other children are still dependent on their parents uh, or on the divorcing spouses. Maintenance of both uh, the minor and dependent adult children and also of the spouses who are in still in financial need and pension interest and ancillary relief. Pension interest. Uh, it is a pension interest, which is a pension funds, retirement annuities, and provident fund. They are deemed to form part of a spouse's asset during a divorce for the purpose of determining the matrimonial benefits. So, for example, if spouses are married in community of property, the Supreme Court of Appeal in the case of Ndaba versus Ndaba have confirmed that the spouses or the spouse who does not have a pension automatically has 50% share of uh, their spouse's uh, pension, in other words, the member spouse's uh, pension. 
spouses each have a 50% share over each other's pension benefits. Please see page 131 to page 132 of your prescribed textbook for a calculation of pension interest. You also need to know the difference between pension interest and pension benefit. Pension interest is an interest that has not yet accrued to the member by the time of divorce. It excludes a withdrawal benefit that accrues to a spouse prior to a divorce. Pension benefit, it is a withdrawal benefit or it is a withdrawal or a pension. A, okay, let me say pension benefit, it is a withdrawal benefit that has already accrued to the men. Basically, it is a pension that has already uh, been withdrawn and the money has already been paid over to the spouse. So that is known as pension benefit, but pension interest is uh, the one that is still in the hands of the pension administrators. Section 7, subsection 8, uh, subsection A of the Divorce Act empowers a court granting a decree of divorce to order the members a uh, fund, in other words, the pension administrators. Uh, Pension administrators to uh, to make payment to the non uh, to the non member spouse. So, in other words, if uh, let's say a husband uh, works for for the government department and has a pension benefit, the government employees pension benefit during a divorce. The divorce court or the high court has the powers to order that the pension administrators, uh, government employees, a uh, pension fund uh, give the non member spouse 50% share of their members' uh, pension uh, fund, or oh, as we as we call it uh, the pension interest. So section seven, subsection eight of the Divorce Act empowers a court granting a decree of divorce to order the members, the members want to pay uh, any part of the pension interest. Most of the time is 50% to one spouse's emerit income to property, which is due to their member spouse directly to the non-member. Uh, directly to the non-member. Please know that the non-member has a choice of uh, saying, I want the money to be paid directly into my bank account or the money to be transferred to another pension fund. Please see page 133 to page 134 of the prescribed textbook for a discussion on the payment or transfer of the non-member uh, non spouse's pension of the pension interest. Although, uh, although we have a non, uh, although we have a non, a false divorce system, and when spouses are married, uh, when spouses are married. Uh, the general rule, if I may say that, is that uh, the marriage must be dissolved or the matrimonial estate must be uh, dissolved in accordance with the marriage contract or the matrimonial property system that the parties have entered into. Uh, there is what is known as for feature of patrimonial or matrimonial benefit. Section 9, subsection A of the Divorce Act empowers the court uh, that grants a divorce order that grants a divorce order to give an order of either total or partial benefit of their matrimonial uh, benefit. Before the court can give uh, this order, there are factors that the court needs to consider. Firstly, uh, the duration of the marriage. Secondly, the circumstances that led to the breakdown of the marriage. And thirdly, 
any substantial misconduct on the part of either spouse. It is important to know that uh, besides the duration of marriage and the circumstances which led to the breakdown of the marriage, the misconduct, uh, it is taken into account when the court determines for future, but the court does not just con uh, consider misconduct. It must consider substantial misconduct. That is a misconduct that is so gross that it will really be so unfair that the spouse get the share uh, of their matrimonial uh, from the matrimonial estate. For example, if the parties are married in terms of property and upon uh, getting married, the one spouse was never available in the ma marriage. Uh, there is a excessive uh, extramarital affairs. Uh, the spouse never contributed financially or non-financially in the estate. Uh, and the spouse who is requesting for future was literally uh, the one holding the family and uh, although they were married, the situation was just that they were not in a marriage at all. So it must be a, a substantial misconduct and a, a spouse must be able to prove that if uh, the forfeiture is not granted, it will really be unfair. Also, you need to know that a spouse does not forfeit what is theirs. So if the spouse uh, is the one, let's say, the spouse entered the marriage uh, with an immovable property or after getting married, she bought the immovable, he or she bought the immovable property and uh, paid it off and everything. And but besides that, they never contributed anything and they behaved in such a grossly misconduct uh, manner. When the court orders that they forfeit either 50% uh, of the matrimonial estate or partial, the court cannot order that they forfeit what is there, something that they spent uh, money on and uh, something that they spent money on and something that belongs to them. So the court can order that they for 50%, uh, let's say, of everything in the joint estate except this immovable property whereby they will retain their 50% and the other spouse will also get 50% of that immovable property. So forfeiture may only be granted if the court is satisfied that a spouse will be unduly benefited if the order is not granted. Okay. Let's move along. Now redistribution of a uh, asset. Redistribution of asset is also Another way that the court deviates, uh, deviates or it doesn't uh, follow uh, the matrimonial property system of uh, the spouses. Redistribution of assets is regulated by Section 7, Subsection 3 of the Divorce Act. Section, section 7, subsection 3 empowers the court to redistribute assets of the one spouse to the other if it deems to be just and fair. There are prerequisites, in other words, there are requirements that must be uh, complied with uh, before distribution can actually be ordered. Restribute, uh, section 7, subsection 3 has two clauses which, uh, which are applicable to non-black spouses and to white, colored, and Asian. Section 7, subsection 3, subsection A of the Matrimonial Act applies to white, Asians, and colored. It applies to uh, spouses who are married, 
before 1 November 1984. That is before the Matrimonial Property Act uh, came into existence. And the party's marriage or the spouse's marriage must be out of community of property in terms of the anti contract. Before uh, the Matrimonial Property Act became law, nine black spouses, the Asians were the colored, uh, had a choice of either getting married in community of property or out of community of property without the accrual system. The accrual system did not exist at the time. So when they wanted to marry out of community of property, they needed to enter into an anti uh, contract excluding community of property. When the Matrimonial Property Act came into existence on 1 November 1984, it, it, it introduced the accrual system. But uh, when it came into existence, the act, the Matrimonial Property Act, was not retroactive. So in order to protect spouses who are married or who are married and are still alive out of community of property without uh, the out of community of property and the marriage was entered into before 1 November 1984 and they are a non-black spouses, a spouse who had contributed to their spouse's uh, estate, uh, to their spouse's estate, could ask the court to redistribute uh, assets from their spouse's estate to their estate. Normally, it would have been wives who most of the time were housewives. They would ask the court to redistribute assets from their husband's estate to uh, their estate. It is important to note that on 11 May 2002, there was a landmark judgment in G uh, versus Minister of Home Affairs G, which is for a uh, Greenland, the applicant or the wife who put in uh, the case was Mrs. Uh, uh, Mrs. Greenland. And the matter was brought in at the Pretoria High Court. The Pretoria High Court uh, held that Section 7, Subsection A of the Matrimonial Property Act, it is unconstitutional and invalid in that it does not uh, extend to spouses who are married out of community of property uh, without the accrual system, but those marriages occurred after 1 November 1984. This judgment is pending confirmation by the Constitutional Court. Now for black spouses, black spouses, uh, the provision applicable for black spouses is, or let me say was, section, uh, or is section 7, subsection 3, subsection B. This uh, section previously stated uh, or is stated that black spouses who were married, whose marriage was automatically out of community of property, uh, without, uh, which was entered into without the anti contract. This was the default matrimonial property system for black people who entered into a civil marriage before 2 December 1988. In terms of section 22, subsection C of the Black Administrative Act, this uh, section, section, oh no, this section, section 22, subsection 6 of the Black Matrix of the Black Administrative Act has been declared, has been declared unconstitutional by the Constitutional Court in the case of Sitole versus Sitole. The result of this, uh, oh, they declared it unconstitutional and after they declared that all civil marriages that uh, 
that were automatically out of community of property before 2 December 1988 are now deemed to be automatically in community of property. The, the effect or the result of this is that the provisions of section 7, subsection 3, subsection B are no longer applicable to black spouses because the provision itself had said that the marriage had to be entered into in terms of section 22, subsection 3 of the Black Administrative Act. But now this section has been declared uh, unconstitutional and uh, because the marriage is had to be out of community of property. But for now, these marriages are now automatically in community of property. The unfortunate, uh, the unfortunate uh, situation that we find ourselves now is that for black spouses who entered or, or who are in a civil marriage which was entered into after 2 December 1988, let's say from 3 December 1988, and they are married out of community of property uh, in terms of the antinatural contract. There is no uh, provision or there is yet a court judgment that gives them the right to also ask the court for redistribution of uh, assets from their spouse to, uh, to their estate. As, uh, as I stated that for non-white spouses, the G versus Minister of Home Affairs has declared Section 7, Subsection 3, Subsection A unconstitutional because it does not take into account uh, marriages that occurred after 1 November 1984. But there is yet a court judgment that uh, invalidate and renders section 7, subsection 3, subsection B unconstitutional. Please uh, uh, read your textbook to also understand the, the constitutional dilemma of section 7, subsection 3. For example, it does not apply to spouses in some sex marriages. It does not apply to spouses uh, whose marriages uh, or who are who where the spouses uh, where the spouses are non-South African, not the spouses, the husband is a non-South African and where uh, and from the spouse's country, they do not have a, a provision like section seven, subsection three. Just to quickly do a recap, uh, remember that South African women, they follow the laws of the husband's country. So if a South African woman gets married to a South African man, the laws of South Africa will apply. But if a South African woman gets married to a Nigerian, a, a Nigerian man who is only in South Africa, let's say uh, that Nigerian man is not a citizen of South Africa, but they get married in South Africa, the matrimonial property system of Nigeria will apply and the automatic, the automatic default system is out of community of property unless the spouses enter into an antinatural contract which renders their marriage in community of property. So if a, a spouse is married to a foreign husband, a wife is married to a foreign husband, and the foreign husband's country does not have any provision regarding redistribution of assets, eh? those spouses, unfortunately, uh, they do not, or at the present moment, they cannot, re they cannot request the court to redistribute assets from one spouse to another. Also, uh, it is important to note that the Constitutional Court in the case of Gumete versus the President of the Republic of South Africa, they have held that, or they have extended uh, the court's judicial discretion, judicial discretion, in other words, 
only the court uh, dissolving a marriage has the discretion uh, or has the power to decide whether to order redistribution or not. So they could, in the Kumete case, they have extended this uh, or they extended the right to claim using section seven, subsection three uh, to uh, spouses who are in a customary marriage, irrespective of when the marriage was entered into and irrespective of the matrimonial property system of the marriage. The requirement of a distribution order. Please, it is important to know that section seven, subsection uh, three, can only uh, can only be ordered or the powers have the powers to only order it if there are certain conditions that have been complied with so when you study this section you need to study section seven subsection three uh, in a uh, line also with section seven, subsection four, subsection five, and subsection six. So those conditions also uh, the court must take them into account. For example, section seven, subsection four of the divorce act uh, states that the spouse who seeks redistribution, who seeks redistribution, must have contributed directly or indirectly to the maintenance or increment of the spouse's estate during the subsistence of the marriage, and the court must be satisfied that. By reason of such contribution, it is equitable and just to make a distribution order. Please also uh, know that the position of foreign marriages in uh, Section 7, Subsection uh, 3, especially Section 7, Subsection 9, which says uh, of the Divorce Act, it empowers the South African court, which grants a divorce uh, to order redistribution of assets only if the foreign state or the foreign country also has the powers to redistribute uh, assets. So in other words, in uh, the country of the husband, the foreign husband, if they have provisions which also allows the court to redistribute assets, it's only then that our court in South Africa can make this order. If the foreign country does not have uh, those provisions, the South African court also are powerless or they, there is no provision to actually make such an order. This is in terms of section seven, subsection nine of the divorce act. Now maintenance of a spouse after divorce. When spouses get married, there is a automatic duty for the spouses to maintain each other. And this duty comes to an end when the marriage is terminated. There are, however, two exceptions. The first one is section seven, subsection one of the divorce act. This is when the spouses in their settlement agreement, they agree that uh, one spouse will pay spousal maintenance to the other. And uh, this settlement agreement needs to be made in order of court. The second, a exception is section seven, subsection two of the divorce act. Uh, this uh, section states that the court has a discretion to make an order for payment of post-divorce disposal maintenance uh, for any period or up until death or remarriage if uh, there are certain conditions or factors that can be proven. Please see section one, uh, please see page 158 to 159 of the prescribed textbook uh, for the factors that the court must take into account when determining whether to grant an order for post-divorce spousal maintenance in terms of section seven, subsection two of the Divorce Act. 
you also need to know the types of maintenance that we have. We've got rehabilitative maintenance, which is maintenance for a limited fixed period of time. We have lump sum maintenance, which is maintenance that is paid as a lump sum. And we have a token or nominal uh, maintenance. Uh, this is when there is a there is no reasonable ground to grant maintenance at the time of divorce, but uh, it can be foreseeable that in the future a spouse might be in need for maintenance. For example, let's say a spouse uh, is working, but uh, that spouse is in a fixed contract and there is a there is a, a possibility that that contract will not be renewed. So at the time of termination of the marriage, the spouse might not be in need of maintenance because they are getting in an income. But once uh, the marriage is the, their contract is, uh, or when the contract ends, they may find themselves unemployed and thereby in need of maintenance. And the other uh, type of maintenance is the most common one, the monthly payment of maintenance, the monthly payment of maintenance. Okay, now a uh, recession, suspension and variation of a maintenance order. This is a uh, this is regulated by Section 8, Subsection 1 of the Divorce Act. Uh, this section states that a maintenance order granted in terms of the Divorce Act may be rescinded, uh, suspended, or varied if there are sufficient or good reasons for doing so. Termination of a maintenance order. A maintenance order granted in terms of Section 7, Subsection 1 of the Divorce Act. That is through a... That is, uh, through a settlement agreement is terminated in terms of the terms. In other words, in accordance with the terms in the settlement uh, agreement. But the one that is, that is granted in terms of section seven, subsection two of the divorce act, that is a that is a maintenance that is being granted through a court order. The duty to pay maintenance comes to an end as per court order. Uh, this can either be either through death, remarriage, or if the rehabilitative maintenance period has now come to an end. Student, this brings to an end. The summary of uh, this point to an end, the summary for termination of a civil marriage. Please remember that you are still required to study your prescribed textbook, you study your prescri uh, the study guide, and also the updated information that we post on the tutorial letters. Thank you for taking time to listen. Please feel free to send me an email should you need to talk to me one-on-one -on -one or should you need clarification on something. My email address is a m o n a r k n at unisa.ac.za. Thank you, students, and good luck with your studies. Thank you. Goodbye.